Welcome all to Massive Masters Raising Private Capital. We are live today. My name is Maria Marks, and I'm so excited for today. We have an awesome, awesome speaker and our first female guest, which is a huge, huge thing to, to promote because anytime we have female speakers is amazing and exciting. So us at Massive Masters Raising Private Capital, we are on 13 different platforms. If uh, you are not watching live, they are all at the bottom of your screen. And I'm not going to read all of them out for you, but they are anywhere that you can listen to a podcast. There they are there. Just a quick disclaimer, we are um, not here to promote ourselves as financial educators. If you have any questions, any financial questions, please do your own form of due diligence. We are not pushing our own financial agenda. So please do not take anything that we say as financial gold. Please do your own research. Here at Massive Capital, we are a very, very robust company. We are located across the United States in Denver, Texas, Georgia, North Carolina, and we are emerging markets in Arizona and Florida. We have over 250 assets under management and our partners in Realty One have almost 300 assets under management. We are a full functioning company with equity brokerage, property management, development, construction, and education. If you'd like to know more, please reach out to any of us at Massive Capital. We'd love to explain that a little bit more to you. We have one opportunity if you'd like to invest with us. It is called Horizon. There's just a few spots left, and we closed on this property in February. So if you'd like to invest in a property that has already started the process of renovations and a takeover process, please reach out. It's very exciting to see what has already been done. But now I have the privilege of introducing my friend, the my favorite person. Her name is Julie Roy. And let me get her wonderful bio up right here. She is an authentic, she has an authentic passion for propelling entrepreneurs for the next level of success. She radiates from the stage. Her presence at your event will invigorate and inspire the audience, ensuring the way they walk satisfied and encouraged and enthusiasm for what they came for. She has a, um, she, she's so amazing in the way that she delivers authentic insights for concrete and change. Her invaluable insights provide her attendees for a clear roadmap for well-informed business decisions and open their eyes for new possibilities. She loves sharing her experiences with her audience and empowering entrepreneurs to dream bigger, be bolder, and take action to claim the abundance that awaits. Julie delivers, delivers polished, professional, and powerful messages that create that the audience will crave. I know her in real estate. You might not know her in real estate, but I do. So I know her as a multifamily titan of industry. That's how I know her. I'm so excited to talk to Miss Julie Roy. Hello, Maria. So excited to be on today and so grateful for the opportunity and especially to be the first female. I love it. Um, I'm all about female vibes. So um, love the partnership, love being able to pour into others and just super happy to be here with you today. One of my favorite folks. Thank you. You've also raised $25 million into real estate, which is huge. Yeah. So that is on my syndication side. So yeah. we have um, raised some money from friends, family, colleagues, new folks um, that want to syndicate with us in our deals and, and have a partnership with us. Um, yeah, we're really excited that we were able to you know, learn from some really great people, um, have some mentorship from some of the big gurus, um, Grant Cardone and folks like that. I'm a, obviously I'm a student of Grant Cardone's, you know, that uh, private yep. student, but, um, but more so I think what really fills my heart about um, raising capital and being able to offer 
these types of investments to other folks is that like, we didn't know what we didn't know. And so the ability for us to be able to bring folks into our syndications and deals with us um, just offers them opportunities that maybe would not otherwise be available to them. And so for me, um, you know, coming from the background I came from and just growing up the way we did, we didn't have the knowledge um, right. about syndication, uh, raising private capital, helping others, collaborating at the top, right, rather than competing at the bottom, um, just allowing and enabling others to have success with you is probably our greatest accomplishment, I'd say, yet today. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. So you did not get started in real estate, which is why I love you more than ever, because I did not as well. Yeah. So tell our listeners and the people who are here today, what you did before you did real estate. So I was a preschool teacher initially um, in a Montessori preschool. Um, I was working for another woman named Michelle, and I just fell in love with the process of Montessori. If any of you know Montessori, I'm a super passionate early educator. Um, I just honestly wanted this for my kids. I thought one day I just really want them in a Montessori program. And so I started working in this Montessori preschool before and after school, just helping out, fell in love with the program, ended up getting my training, was helping this woman like basically run her school. I was doing tours. I started to get really heavily involved in the operations. We were expanding. I was bringing in parents and I love communication and connection. That's just, I think a very natural thing for me. And I'm super, super authentic and integrity is my, like my non-negotiable. So I think people love those things about me in any work, right. In any type of um, scenario. So I think that's why it also helps me with the money raising piece, because right. I'm very, very clear about what things are not acceptable to me and what things are acceptable. And I think people knowing where you're coming from is, is a really great attribute to have when raising capital, but going back to your, I'm ADHD, so I'm going to be all over, but, um, so I started this Montessori preschool in the basement of the church after working for Michelle, I was like, I want to do this for myself. I love this. I was in law school. I hated it. So I took a turn for a very different profession, um, started this preschool in the basement of my ch church with a negative $25,000 loan to a loan shark called Malcolm Banks, which I then figured out was probably not his real name. But anyways, at the time, I believed it. And we took out this loan at 19%. My husband um, at the time was my boyfriend. I had him come with me and the loan shark, I guess that's what he was. We thought he was just a nice guy lending money. He oh said God. to my husband, hey, um, if Julie doesn't pay this loan back, you know, like we're going to be looking for you. And he kind of looked at me like, girl, like, what are you getting us into? Anyhow, long story short was the best 19, 19% loan I've ever taken in, in my life, um, was able to expand the schools into a platform, sell to private equity in 2011, do the same thing in the U S in Omaha, which we're now located in, in 2021. Um, we sold again to private equity, having a second capital sale. So why I got into multifamily. And so I'm giving you a little backstory is because we had a big capital event and we had a lot of taxes to pay. And um, we sold the schools to a private equity company, but this time we were much smarter. We bought all the real estate. And so I fell in love with sale leasebacks, which is really what we were doing. We were creating a holding company to sell the schools or to, sorry, we were creating a holding company to run the real estate of the schools. So we were the management of the real estate holding company. So that was Roy Holdings, for example, the right. schools rented from us, which was also ourselves, but in a different corporation. And so we started loving this idea of, wow, this passive income thing of like, even though it was ourselves to ourselves, it was like, whoa, this concept works really well. So in Canada, when we sold, we started to get passive income from being the landlords of the new corporate entity that signed leases with us, right? So we kept the real estate initially. On the second sale, we got smarter. We coupled the real estate into a group. So all of the locations provided a portfolio. We sold that portfolio of real estate to a REIT. That REIT then paid us on the real estate that we had had the new owners who we sold the private, like the private equity owners, we created a triple net 15 year lease 
and had them sign that before we went to the private, before we went to the REITs to sell the real estate. So we sold the businesses to the private equity company and the real estate to the REIT that had all these triple net 15 year leases in place. And we were like, like the, it was game changing. It was seriously a capital uh, utopia, honestly. So we were like, wow, the ability to own real estate is the game changer here. Like this was a wealth game changer for us. Yes, the capital events on the sales were definitely significant, but in relation to the long-term legacy wealth we're building through the real estate portfolio, we wouldn't have been able to do it without the businesses, obviously, but the um, insurmountable like multitude, I guess, or difference on the real estate side was that we were now selling these triple net leases basically. And so you're not just getting paid anymore for the entity or the real estate, you're getting paid for the leases, which have way more value. So the leases were signed for 12 and 15 years at triple net. So this is a very like lucrative lease to buy. Um, we could have kept them, but we ended up selling, we 1031 all that money into triple net. So we bought Starbucks, Taco Bell's, learning experiences, kinder cares, dollar stores. I'm trying to remember all of them. So we created this whole so portfolio. So then every month, our bank account just fills up with the passive income that we're getting on all of these triple net leases. So we live 100% passively. So we were like, this is life. Like this is game changing. Like we're traveling all over the world and you know, we get these notifications of passive income. I'm like, this is literally the dream, right? However... There's a little caveat when you have passive income and you don't have a business, you don't have any write-offs. So we got this large anticipation uh, tax bill in the fourth quarter. We do quarterly strategies, um, tax strategy meetings with our CPA, who's phenomenal. But while we do that, we had this alert in fourth quarter, like, hey, you're going to have $570,000 in taxes to own because your passive income superseded this much amount. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, that is not cool. We're not doing this. So I was like, OK, Julie, you're a business owner. You're a solutionist. You're going to fix this. We're not paying this money. So how do we how do we do that? So I started researching passive income eradication of tax. And so. I ended up finding some gurus online. I started following them. I was like, I had already understood and knew about Grant Cardone, but I wasn't implementing anything. Um, and I didn't think I needed it because I was a business owner. Like, why would I right. need to income, right? I don't care about that stuff. Oh yeah, no, I do. <laughs> and I should have a long time ago before I started. Um, I just say what we're doing now, I wish we would have known and done 30 years ago. Like the faster we could have started, on creating passive income streams, the better. Like that would have been so, so incredible to know about um, and to implement, you know, even 15 years ago, let's call it, when we actually had money, right? Um, so long story short, um, we have this portfolio now that brings in a ton of money monthly through our triple nets. So we create um, really great opportunities for people one of the things that people love about investing with us is that we only do a 90-10 split. So we're very much about the client. Um, right. So they are getting a really good return um, on investment. And so we get monthly um, cash flow day one. We buy only new. We have relationships with developers that call us. We just signed another deal last night. Like these things are constantly coming to us. If we wanted to, we would have an abundance of opportunity for deals, but that is created through relationships. And we can talk a little bit about that as well. But the big thing that we want to stress here is that we have a trifecta strategy of investing. So the triple net was bringing our income in. We needed to replace our active income from our business sale. Like we had a lot of income coming in from our business right. that no longer was available when you sell the business. So yes, you have a ton of money, but if you keep deducting the money from your business sale, you're going to end up with zero money at some point. If you're not reinvesting that money to create more money for you, you're going to end up with no money. <laughs> so we quickly, you know, put all that money into cash flowing property. So the triple net pays us monthly to live, to do whatever we want, to reinvest. Um, 
we have four kids. So, I mean, we have a, we go through a lot of money a month uh, and we knew that we needed at least a million dollars in passive income a year to function. And so we had to make sure when we created our portfolio that we had that active income, quote unquote, which is now passive being replaced. So that was number one, check the box. We, we did that with the triple net income. Then this tax problem became a huge issue. We found multifamily. Right. Multifamily was able to eradicate all of that passive income that we were coming in through the purchase of multifamily through the bonus depreciation. So when we buy multifamily, we get something called a negative K-1. We apply this, we call it a negative K-1 cloud. We keep filling the cloud so that we can pull down and eradicate any of the tax that we make on the passive income. So we have not paid taxes now for three years. Um, we continue to buy multifamily for that reason solely. We don't love multifamily for the cash flow because it is not a cash flow producing yeah. entity. Yeah. And people get confused, Maria, about the purpose of multifamily. The end game may give you the multiple, right? The end game may give you the big bang, but in multifamily, if you're looking for cash flow, that is not typical of a multifamily deal. The triple net is a cash flow producing entity. It's less multiple on sale, but you're getting that consistent reliant cash flow. Right. Multifamily is a tax strategy for us. It is, you know, that is what we use it for. And we use it for the multiple at the end, but it's not a drip. It's not a cash drip for us. Which I think you hit the nail on the head there with why you're so good at raising capital for those multifamily properties is because you can really identify what your investors are looking for. Your investors, the people who you're talking uh, talking to and really talking for are those people who need tax saving solutions. The people right. who need the extra tax solutions, but who need the depreciation, who need the, that long-term drip and who aren't needing those cash flowing solutions. There are people who, yes, they they might not understand when they're new capital raisers, but um, so they they hit the head. They're like, oh, it's so cash flowing, it's so great, and and you're you're listening to their pitch, and you're like, uh, it's, it's kind yeah. of hard. And to hear honestly, I will tell you, I was one of those people. I got into multifamily thinking I was going to have this drip of passive income as well. That's what was sold to me initially, right? right? Like you're going to have this passive income drip. First of all, very rarely do multifamily entities pay monthly, very rarely. And I tell everyone in multifamily, if you want to stand out, pay people monthly and pay them starting month one. I'm going to tell you right now, that is the way to stand out. People, if you're dripping into their account monthly, you're thought about monthly. You are right. an asset and you're a positive in their life. Even if it's a dollar. I mean, I think I about it what it is. You're going in their bank account monthly. I tell everyone who's raising capital, if you want to create positive relationships and you want to have people trust you, you give them money monthly because that is showing a lot of things. It's showing that you're putting the LPs first, that you are committed you know, to giving them that return back, that you're also committed to showing them that this product is cash flowing, right? Like these are the things that as an investor, that's what I look for now. You don't pay monthly, we're out. You don't have a cash flowing entity day one. That's not something that I'm interested in. Now for multifamily, I realize there's value add properties. We've also learned a lot about value add properties. We are in many value add properties. Again, for the tax stratification process for us, this eradication of tax is extremely important. It is a intentional strategy for us. If we didn't have that, Maria, we would be paying that money to the government. So for us, it was you either pay, let's call it $100,000. I give this $100,000 to the IRS and never see a penny of it again, or try to give this $100,000 to a multifamily uh, operator. Usually we're GPs. So we become general partners. Um, I do like a little bit of control over everything. So Just a, I, little. a slight control issue. So I need to be involved in how the project is going, some decision-making capabilities. I want to make sure that my LPs are protected 1000%. I treat people's money better than my own. Like I would, mm -hmm. I would rather lose money than have anybody that I know love 
you know, and trust and are part of our deals, I never want to lose anyone's money. That is really important to me. So I, I need to know that I've done everything in my power to protect them. So, um, so that's one, two, I want to help people create legacy wealth. That is my whole purpose. I think, um, generosity, our generosity has brought us a lot of goodness. And I really feel like we've been put here to give that goodness back and that knowledge. Right. So I've wrote a book, honestly, called The Multi-Million Dollar Mompreneur. I'm going to like pitch myself for a second. Do it. As but you why, should. I, why I'm telling you this is because I didn't have the ideas in here till way late. And I want people to use those ideas, the things we're talking about today, to help get they're faster. Like I want to compress timelines for people. I don't want them to have to wait 20 years to learn something like today. I had a client call me. I also run a coaching program for businesses who want to scale and either exit for legacy wealth or just create legacy wealth for their families. That's what we did. And I always think like, go to someone who's done it, right? I go to people that have done it for things I want to learn. I don't take a lot of people. It's a very boutique, small coaching program. But why I love this program is like today, someone called me and was like, Julie, like you're, you've been game changing for us. I saved $85,000 today by using, you know, a tax strategy that you gave me. I've, you, I've saved over 200 on the tax strategies in the real estate investment world. Like the things we're able to do in the real estate investment world and using tax as a strategy rather than like the first two pages of the tax code telling you all the things you have to pay for, the other 600 are telling you how not to pay. Who reads them? Nobody. Like I didn't know any of that until way late, right? So I just put this book together to create a really small synopsis of things you could do fairly quickly to change either your income or help you eradicate the tax. And so talking about my journey with multifamily, it really was for me, it came out of need, right? And then people were like, what are you doing? And then I started to tell other people, to tell my colleagues and peers. And I went to, you know, business events that I had a lot of billionaires in the room. Those people were telling me like, why are you paying taxes? I'm like, what do you mean? Why why am I paying taxes? They're like, well, you can do this or you can do that. Or I'm like, thought I had to. I literally thought people were just illegal. I was like, this stuff is not real, is it? And then my CPA, like at the time we had to upgrade CPAs, but my first CPA was like, oh yeah, no, you could do that. I'm like, why are you telling me this stuff? So you really need to find a CPA that is a tax strategist who can use all of these tax codes in your benefit, right? Because people are like, they hate tax. No, I love tax because tax strategy is a huge intentional part of our wealth. Um, And so it's really important though, to use real estate and use these tax strategies to gain momentum and keep like someone put in the chat. Yeah, I love it. I was just going to say, I always tell people that it doesn't matter if your top line is getting really fat, if your bottom line keeps going, you know, to the IRS. And so it is really about how much you keep and all these strategies, um, triple net for income, you know, multifamily to eradicate tax. I do the trifecta is closed with storage and industrial. And I do that because it's a longer term play. It has some tax incentives as well, but it is a different play. And so between the three, I feel like we have a really nice balanced portfolio. People started to ask me, I only did triple net for ourselves for a long time, 10 years. And then people were like, we want to do this. I want to buy a Starbucks, Julie. Like, how do I buy a Starbucks? So the challenging part about triple net is that if you want to buy it by yourself, you need like $3 million capital. Because right now with the rates where they're at, we're buying only cash. And so there's a strategy to that as well. Um, But because rates are, you know, seven, 8% to borrow, if your cap Mm -hmm. rates are five and six, you're actually negative two, right? So that's not working for people. So I said, well, we could get together and buy it together if you want. So I just started bringing in a few people, people that we knew, like, and trusted that were like, hey, we want some passive income. We want that triple net drip. Like, but we can't, I don't want to put 3 million in a deal. So I'm like, perfect. So we started small groups and now we're about 20 to 25 folks. 
in each deal, everyone puts between, you know, a hundred to 500,000 depends on what they want in each of our triple net deals. And then they get cash flow day one. We own the asset out day one. So there's no bank involvement. There's no involvement. Like no one can take the asset from us. Um, we have guaranteed corporate leases, which means if the corporation says, Hey, Julie, we don't like your site anymore. We're going to just ditch. I'm like, no worries, keep paying. They have to still pay you right. for the 10 or 12 years of the initial term. In the meantime, you can always fill that place up with another tenant down the road. So um, I, in this part of my life, I'm 50. I just turned 50 in December. Oh, you don't um, look it at all. So I just turned 50. I have four kids. My oldest just turned 20. It's crazy. But, but my purpose in telling you that is that at 50, my ideals for investment and my ideals for risk are different than they were at 20 and 30. So I also feel like you really have to know your client if or your friends or your colleagues or who's coming in the deal with you. Who is your avatar? Most of my folks are business owners, eventually want to retire with legacy wealth, want to create passive income for their families and want to do it fairly risk-free. Like I'm not saying right. totally, but they are moderate to mild risk takers like myself. So I look for deals that are really solid. Like if Starbucks goes out of business, guys, we have way bigger problems than just me, right? Like than just our site. So, and we still have the, either way, we still have the land and the real estate. So we have the land in the building, no matter what happens, those are paid. So I feel like my people are always protected. It's just a thing for me. Um, so my strategy is a little different, I think, than most. Um, but I really feel like that's what sets me apart um, and sets us apart. But it's at good that your strategy is different because you've played to not only your investors, but you've played to what works for you. And because that works for you, it helps with your story and your pitch and how you talk to your investors, yeah. because that's why they trust you. And that's the whole thing of why we raise capital and why we're able to partner with people, because if they're not trusting you, then you don't have anything to stand on anyway. Right. And so I think there's a few important pieces that like when, because this is about capital raising and right. people on here are learning to raise capital. So I never thought of it as raising capital. I know that sounds ridiculous. And this no, is gonna it doesn't. totally it's different perfect. probably than anybody comes on here saying, I like it, but I'm authentic and I need, you know, I want to, I want to pour out to people what I think has worked. And so I think what's worked is yes, my story. Yes, I, it's proven. It is a living that I'm actually living. I'm creating income monthly by triple net. I'm eradicating tax monthly by multifamily. The portfolio makes sense. The strategy makes sense. But what's most important is I never attacked it or strategized it to be a capital rate. Like I hate even saying I'm a capital raiser. I am a solutionist for people. And that's how I look at it. I think like if, if there's a way to get in a deal and I can help somebody create legacy wealth by helping them be in a deal that they could not otherwise be in, for example, or if I can provide passive income for their family or their kids, um, I see myself as a conduit to legacy wealth versus a strategist capital raiser. I'm definitely a solutionist. I provide solutions for families that have or want legacy wealth that have money that need to invest. And I want to be sure that there is a end game for them that makes sense for them. So like, I want to know what, what is your problem? Like, what can I help you with? What solution can we provide for you? Is it tax eradication? Is it passive income? Like everyone that calls me, the first question I have is like, what is your end game? Like we always start with the end in mind with all of my calls. So when it's a new person, that's like, Hey, um, Julie, Jane told me, this deal she's in with you, she's super happy with you. She loves that she's getting passive income every month. You know, she's, been, and we do have some bonus depreciation in triple net as well. It's just, it hasn't been as great as multifamily. However, now it's a little more balanced because the debt, right, has been so high. So long story short, and the eradication of the bonus depreciation going to 80, 60, we're getting more on a, a playing field with that. But initially, 
the idea was like, if you have a tax problem, we're going to find a solution for you in a multifamily deal because you'll get the multiple longer term. You're not interested in a drip because you have a business making a lot of money right now, right? Um, also, I help them on the flip side. I partner with specialists who can help eradicate active income for them. So like, it's not just like, oh, I'm putting you in a deal, uh, you know, and we're done. No, like I want you as a partner for life. Like I want us to be talking to each other, strategizing about your wealth. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not an accountant. I only tell people, this is what we did that worked for us. I'm like a living, breathing, normal mom coming from like a single mom who worked like three jobs, who, you know, struggled to do what we did, like everything that she did, you know, she worked really hard for. We came from an immigrant Italian family. Work was like work equaled like how well you did in life. Right. So the work ethic for me doesn't end when that money comes in like that money to me, I'm telling you is more important than my own. I will like lay myself on the line every single time in any deal, putting my people first. And so I think that's, that's really the end game. You have to be passionate about other people and helping other people, because this is not a money game at the end of the day. This is a relationship game. This is a uh, relationship creation um, that you should have for life. Like they should want to be friends and collaborate and partner with you for life, right. Not, right. not just a minute. So now yeah. you, I love that you say that you're different because that's so true because everyone who comes on here, they talk about their first raise and they talk about how all the pitfalls they did from their first raise and how it was the hardest thing for them. And you are different. Yeah, your first I'm raise. Tell you, I will tell you about my first race because you asked me to talk about it, but I literally don't care about that part of it. I really don't. I want to help people. Like I right. want, if I would have been able to do this 15 years ago, it would have been even more game changing. Right. I am in but a your great first race was your best. Right. And I'm in a great position, Maria. I'm very lucky. I've been super right. blessed. We've worked really hard. This did not come easy. Like all the things. But I wish I would have known some of this earlier. That's it, you know? So I'm just here to help people learn it faster than it took me. <laughs> I'm pretty like, it takes me a long time to like buy into stuff. So um, I just want to let you know, like that's the piece that I wish I could have compressed the timeline for myself, which is why I think I'm so passionate about offering all this information for people. My first raise was my best raise. It was my easiest raise. And crazy enough, I committed to 500,000, which I thought was like a big, hairy, audacious goal target. I literally said like, Grant was like, aim big. And I'm like, yeah, big 500 grand. And I was like, you know what? Worst case scenario, if I can't raise it, I'm committing to it with my own money. Right. So I knew that I wasn't going to let anybody down. I ended up raising $3 million. And I will tell you, I did that in 24 hours and yeah. I didn't, you were part of it. And I, I did. And my mother-in-law. And your mother-in-law and your family. And listen, yeah. I didn't even like try. Like I was just like, literally, hey, listen, I found about this deal. This is what the deal is with. These are the people that it's with. This is what I'm doing with my own money. If you want to come in, come in. You know, it was more like, let's partner and see like what we can do here. Everybody was like, Julie, if you're going to do it, let's do it. Like, and I was like, 100%. That's the other thing. I'm going to tell you a few things. I am in every deal with my own money. Every single deal. I have as much or more at stake than anybody in my deal. That is really important to me. I know not everyone can do that. So it's challenging when you're starting out because a lot of people don't have the capital. I was in a different position and I'm fully understanding that that was advantageous for me because I had my money where my mouth was really like 100%. If you can't do that though, because not everyone has the capital to be able to do that when they're capital raising, you have to commit that those folks money, like you are going to lay yourself on the line for whatever it takes to protect that money. I don't care about at the end of the day, what that takes. And so and you need to convey that message to your people that you're going to fight for them. You're going to be there. You're going to be in deals where you have a say, like stop signing up for stuff that you just get a percentage of money on. That is not important. At the end of the day, that can entirely ruin your 
everything, your name, your relationship, you have to make sure when you're committing to a deal that you are committing to a solid deal that you believe in 1000% that you can put your name, your money, your mouth, everything in front of. Um, you don't have the money. That means everything else, your integrity, your persona, your authenticity, everything you have has to be part of that deal. And I think a lot of folks, they come into capital raising and they just see it as a business. Like I'm a capital raiser. I'm here to raise funds. Mm -hmm. I literally, I don't even like to be called a capital raiser. I really don't. I, I, I can't stress enough how the business side of the capital raising is the least important side for me. The success of my people in this deal is paramount. 1000%. Right. I have fought with GPs that were like, well, we're going to stop, you know, um, distributions, blah, 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 whatever it is. I'm like, hell, okay. If you're going to do that, these are the questions that you're going to have to have, you know, right. from my people and from me, are you willing to, you know, go to that place, <laughs> you know, or, Hey, this is what we have going on. How are you fixing that? I'm watching occupancy weekly. I'm on calls weekly. I'm reviewing all of the notes of every single deal weekly from our PM management. I'm telling you the capital raisers out there are not doing that. Not most of them, maybe some oh, of yeah. them. And I hope that most of them on this call are, if you're not, you need to be because that is your business. Like that, your name is tied to all of those KPIs and you not knowing that, or you not being involved in that is a detriment to you and everybody that knows you that put their money where, where you are or with you. So, right. They have so much trust in you and you are so excited to be on a team that you're just jumping in just because you want to raise capital because no is still a solid answer you can go you can underwrite a deal you can underwrite the team you can still walk away from it before you take anyone's money so that is still an opportunity to say no to and I think people forget that because they're so excited to just get into this business that they they don't want to say no yeah and then another thing is like you as a capital raiser should not jump into any deal and you should not partner with people that you do not know 1000% and you have not vetted or been in deals with on your own and understand the way they work. I cannot stress enough about being in partnerships. It's like being married. And when people say that it's not a joke, it is like right. you have to be in bed with these folks for at least five years. Um, and if they're making decisions that, don't align with your vision, mission, or values, you should not be doing deals with them, period. Um, again, it goes back to who you are as a person and what name you're putting out there for yourself. We are supposed to be helping people with their financial goals, with their end game, with their targets, know their targets, know where they're going, put them in deals that are right for them. I will say to people, this is not your deal, girl. This is not for you. You are looking for da, da, da. This morning, I had a conversation with one of my coaching clients. She was like, because I've been in, uh, I also do car washes. That's a, a side section of that third, like storage industrial. I have some car wash in there, again, for depreciation. But if you have an IRA, okay, she called me this morning. She was like, I have these IRAs. I have these 401ks. I want to put them in a deal because you can't use them in your own deals, which if you didn't right. know that, you should know that. So I learned that as well, the hard way, but I learned it. So um, if you're putting your IRA money into a multifamily, that's fine, but you have to know that you don't collect appreciation. Lots of folks don't know this. We're not telling people all the story. So if you have an IRA and you cannot, and you're going into this deal because you want depreciation, you're getting none. So if you're not getting depreciation and you're using an IRA, my this is my non-negotiable, another non-negotiable. I have to get a tax eradication strategy from the deal or I have to get money. It's not one. It has to be one or the other. It can't be none, right? So if I have an IRA and I'm going into a deal and I need the tax depreciation, I'm not going to get that from this IRA. So then my only other thing is I need a deal that's making money, period. So I told her that this morning, she was like, oh my God, boom, 
game changer. She's like, I'm not going in this deal. She's like, because I'm not getting depreciation and it doesn't drip me money. Okay, well, there we go. You know, it's very simple, but honesty, integrity, talking through those issues this morning, being available to your clients and your customers. Like literally I am a text away. People know they can text me at any time, day or night, you know, yep, you know, I know. Um, and I'm like, Hey, I'm here. And so also being a constant source of support for your people is really, really important. And so right. this morning, like she could have put her money in this deal and not got what she's really truly targeting for, right? If you're targeting for a tax thing, then use cash, right? Go in with cash into a deal to get that, that eradication, that bonus depreciation, that negative K1. If you're using your IRA, go somewhere that's cash flowing to make money for your IRA that's growing tax-free. Right. Use strategies to the best of your ability to create and keep wealth. That's and those are that's our job to help people with. Well, you Whether could have gotten an investor for one deal, right? You could or have I gotten could have that got investor. an investor that's for, not for happy. that, right. right? Or you could have gotten an investor for life. She might right. not have invested in that one deal, right. the one that you were raising on, or that you needed money on. But now you have someone who's going to invest in every single opportunity that you have. And I honestly, because, yes, and that's, yeah. that's gonna, that's gonna, at the end of the day, feed you as much as it's going to feed her at the end, yeah, because, because it's, you're, it, you're providing it's value fine. to them. Like you are supposed to be a solutionist, a value provider, a conduit to their wealth. See yourself as that. And you will stop making bad decisions about capital raising. Right. right. Like, I think inevitably we have to think of ourselves as those pieces not a capital raiser. I, I even hate the title. I, I just feel like that is not what we should be doing. Raising money is the least amount of importance in our position. Um, We're educating. I, We're educating and helping people understand what that's like. Because we don't, we are not taught this in school. We're not taught what it's like <laughs> to be able to have financial freedom. We're not taught to be able to give money to children, give money to our children's children. We're not taught that. Yeah. And and that is scary to me. And if something happens to my husband, I need to make sure that I can run my finances the way that I need to be able to run my finances. You need to know your business, period. And so exactly. I, I do feel like trust is everything. Someone said trust is success. Like Candy is 1000%. Also trust in yourself. Trust in your gut. Know that the deals that you're going into have to align, right? You have to be aligned. You can't keep going in deals because you get a percentage. That should be the least, the lowest reason or the least important reason why you enter a deal. If you don't believe in it 1000%, if you don't trust yourself in the deal, meaning you don't believe 100% in this deal and you don't feel like it's the right deal for you, then just please don't do the deal. Like it doesn't, pay to do deals that that are uncomfortable I'm not saying okay I'm always about uncomfortable pushing yourself past that but uncomfortable meaning like the gut uncomfortable right I get this gut instinct of mm -mm, something is just not good I either drop the deal close it even with my own like I had a deal on the plate a month ago um, that we were going to go under LOI for. And um, Bo does a lot of the back research. So I have to give him a lot of credit for doing this stuff. But he came to me and he's like, hey, this area, let's go like check it out. I, I just don't know, um, you know, about this, that we checked it out and we just didn't feel good about it. So we dropped the deal. We were like, you know what? We're not going to do it. Um, and sometimes losing a little bit of money saves losing a lot of money and or trust and we just won't do it like that is a non-negotiable for us as well um someone asked me about how much i get on a monthly cash flow so i'm netting over a million and a half a year in in um cash flow net net profit cash flow um and so yeah like one of my deals for example is a kinder care there's a few um and I probably shouldn't say the names of them. Anyway, so I have a deal. Um, one of my deals brings $40,000 a month. So another one brings 30, another one brings 15, another one brings 12. And so, you know, it, 
it really depends on your deal. Of course, some of these buildings were $8 million. We paid for those, right? Like, so this is my personal portfolio, sorry, not my syndicated portfolio. I should probably make sure everyone knows that because there was a lot of capital involved in that single portfolio. In my syndicated portfolios, like let's do um, one of my deals. I can actually say the Starbucks, for example, like their corporate entity, it's, you can find it online. They pay about... Twelve to fifteen thousand dollars a month in rent. We normally have twenty to twenty-five people in our deals. They're we are boutique style real estate. We are not about quantity. We're about quality. So the people in our deals, we know them. They like us. We trust each other. Those twenty to twenty-five people on every hundred thousand invested will make about five hundred to five fifty a month in passive cash flow, net. Like that goes to them net. Um, and it's every month on the dime on the first, it gets deposited. We flow it out right to them from cash flow. It's literally within their bank account in the first week, every month it's clockwork. Um, they don't ever wait for money. Um, when you sign triple net corporate leases, you know exactly what you're getting a month. So you divide it by the amount of people in the deal and we sell shares. So we shall, we sell them based on like $100,000 gives you this much money. So everyone knows exactly what they're coming into. The other thing about corporate triple net leases, they have rent bumps. So all of our rent bumps are pre-established. So everyone knows in five years, we're getting 10% on our NOI. So you already know what your money is going to be doing and is projected for. I like that because I'm a control freak. So for me, I need to know exactly every month what's coming in my bank account. Um, right. I also love the fact that I know in five years, my NOI is automatically going 10% higher than it, it is now. I right, also, and that's, a, but that's a benefit of triple net, a little right. bit different than a multifamily yes. that can fluctuate even more than a pro forma. So it can go up even or better down. So, or down. Correct. Mm -hmm. So like, that's my problem with multifamily is that right. there's a lot of variety and um, I appreciate it for the tax. Like I said, my issue with multifamily is because I'm a control freak. I don't like that. There's months where I'm not getting paid months where I'm getting paid months where the performance not being reached. Now we have occupancy stuff. There's a lot of variables and I'm not saying it's bad. It is a right. conduit to a strategy of our success. It's just not the one I use for income. You see, like, so um, in the multifamily side, I love, again, the tax strategy of it with the triple net, the other bonus, I think, and I'm not trying to tr sell triple net to people because it's not as no, easy. I as like me. it because it helps, it helps us see a different side of it. We're always talking about multifamily. Look, I know I am. So and it's you good guys to see the other side of too. it. Yeah. Right. And, right. But I think what's different about the triple net as well is that for moderate to mild risked individuals that want cash flow, it's a better product for them. Right. If you're looking for tax eradication and a higher multiple in five years and you have time, no problem. But it's where you have to meet your people where they're at. So some of my clients, they only love the multifamily stuff. They only want tax eradication. The ones that are exiting though, businesses and creating legacy wealth, they're like, Hey, I want to replace the active income. I need something that cash flows monthly. I'm not touching my, my capital, right? I want things that are coming in. So I think it just depends again, like meet your people where they're at, find out what they need, be the best conduit in whatever product it is that you want to offer them. Um, it should be whatever is in their best interest. Um, the other thing that I was going to say about triple net is that because it's, corporate guaranteed. The thing that I like about it is we have no expenses. So they pay the taxes, which is a huge variable in multifamily. They pay the insurance, another huge variable today. Um, and we don't have any expenses. And so it's stabilized, meaning like the money that you get monthly doesn't change. So that piece of it for people who are mild risk, we like that. It, may, it feels good to know that, right? So for people that are cool with moderate to higher level risk or changeability, multifamily works great because there is probably a multiple that's a lot higher on exit. Um, and just having that bigger percentage of growth on their money long-term 
works for like a lot of people. I like to know I'm getting five plus percent on my money and it's pretty safe and it's backed by real estate, right? Like that's well, the education is on huge. The stock market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, everything's better than the stock market. Yes. Well, we feel that way too. We have no <laughs> money in the stock market at all right. anymore. I mean, I would call it play money. Bo has a little bit, but um, I don't do any of it because I just like the fact that we own these, you know, land and buildings ownership of that to me is, um, is where, where I feel good and I feel comfortable. So we do what I want, <laughs> no, but it is, he's, he loves it too. Right. So obviously it's been game changing for our family. So, um, yeah, it works. So moving back into, into building these relationships with your investors, um, going to these events, and this is, I've kind of asked this question to all of, to all of my guests on this show. It's, it's hard to go to like a Cardone event or a Sum Rock event or an event because we're not finding those investors because there's like one and we all end well, up. Because everyone there is for the same reason. Everyone there is wanting investors. Everyone there is looking to be a capital raiser. Like, right. Again, so where are you going? Where are you going to find these people? That you're I'm honestly not going anywhere. They're literally coming to us. I'm not going anywhere. However, I will tell you that there are a couple things that as a new raiser, or if you're looking for capital raising strategies, one is do not go there and pass out your business cards. It is the most annoying ridiculous. No one is giving you money because you have, I'm a capital raiser on your business card and you've not done anything or proved any worth to these people. Create value, go to them, ask them what they're looking for, ask them what they need. See if you can help them. I always first provide a ton of value to people. I always say, okay, like, Hey, I'm Julie. And then they'll say, well, what have you done? Or what are you doing? So I do give them my story because I feel like it's important for them to know what I've done because I look for people who have done what I want to do, right? Where, who's my next target person that I want to be like, Oh, okay. I want to be da da da. I'm going to them to learn it. So I want them to know, like I've done the path, right. And I've, I've done the mistakes for them. I have created this compressed timeline. I offer value. Here's how I can help you. Here's my downloadable book of things we've done. I'm going to give you a free book. I'm going to help you with whatever. Be there, say, if you need anything, you can text me or call me. I never say I have a deal. I never say I want you in a deal. I never ask anyone to be in a deal. I put it out there and say, here's our new investment. Like the one we did last night, I'll be sending an email out the next day or two saying, hey, we have this. There's 28 spaces. If you are interested, let me know. I almost always um, have people bringing other people to me. Hey, Julie, da da da, you know, Shirley wants to be in the deal now because I was in it last year and I've been showing her what I've been making every month. People, if you are honest, you provide value, you are of integrity, you have similar missions, visions, and values, and you align with the folks that you're associating with. They want to be in your deals. Now, I know if you're new and you don't have the experience or you, it's a different story, I, I understand that. So what you need to do is you need to learn enough to be seen as an expert, to know that you have the value to give them and start creating value. Go to places, talk at places, do webinars, help people learn about what you're doing, um, be there on a text, on a phone call when they have a question. Um, provide value. That's the biggest thing I can tell you is like, put yourself out there, provide value, put yourself in rooms with people. I wouldn't go to capital raising events. I wouldn't go to raising events. I wouldn't go to places. I'm trying to not say names of specific I summits. I, that's not where you're going to go to raise money. You're going to go learn, learn. about maybe tactics, strategies, solutions of things that you might be encountering that is not don't ask me for money at one of those events ever like ever don't show me your deal don't try to bring me in for a private conversation about what how awesome your deal is I don't care I'm not there for that 
and neither is 98% of the room. I'm being be honest. You know how I am. So I'm true. Explain- it's so true. If, if you don't want to know, don't ask me, but I'm going to be honest. And so where you can find folks, if you're looking for new people, start a newsletter, start a CRM, a customer relations, start building relationships online, go to in-person events in your town, real estate meetups, um, business chamber of commerce, where business owners are, join, um, what am I in, EO, join groups that have high net wealth business owners, high net wealth individuals that have money that they need to do things with, Um, go to places where your deal can provide financial goals and values for people. Do not go to fundraising events and please do not pass out your business cards. It is super tacky and so annoying to anybody that is a professional, a business owner, anything. It is the worst move. I will never do business with anyone that approaches me like that. That is just my non-negotiable. I love that. Sorry. That's my favorite. <laughs> Sorry, you did, my like, favorite. you've done this to me. Um, you I definitely- think I've given you a business card. I actually think I have one of your business cards, Julie. Well, that's because we were at an event talking about something else, I think. We didn't start with, hey, I have a deal, right? So I actually, I think we had a friend in common that introduced did. us, but- yeah, I will. I will not. That's just not what I do. I do give out really awesome business cards. I will tell you, you. Do. They I are remember. Beautiful, they are metal and they are not forgettable because I want you to remember me and what value I had to offer They're you. Heavy. I, again, <laughs> you probably still have it because if you, people feel bad to throw them out. So it is a great, it's a great, there's a capital raising tip. Spend there you go. On Be great different. business cards. If you're going to pass out business cards, because you've added value to someone and they're like, hey, can I have your contact? Then give them a really nice business card that has a purpose. So some of my metal business cards are bookmarks. Some of them are bottle openers for guys. I have beer can openers, whatever it is. Have something fun and memorable. Um, you'll stand out. Again, though, I gave value. I gave them something they could use. I'm not like I'm always worried about giving not enough value. That is really how I live my life in all things I do. Anyone that knows me, my coaching clients, if they're on here watching today, they're going to say the same thing. Like Julie's always asking, am I providing enough value? Is there anything else you need? Is there anything else I can do for you? Those are the questions you should be asking. It's such a true statement. And I'm glad you said that because if you follow Julie on any form of social media, you'll notice that too. She provides more than enough value in her posts I don't even know if you write I I am assuming you write your content too. every single morning uh-huh I, I mean just the amount of value she posts on those and that's where if you don't have the ability to get started the way Julie did that's where you can get started too yeah. her content is gold go follow her go find her on every form of social media because her content is amazing. Her book is fantastic. She has a podcast. She is out there everywhere. So if you're not following her, that is a mistake on your end. And I think you need to be because I love her. All these folks that are like in here to learn these things, these are all things they can do. There's nothing on here besides having my capital event for my own yes. portfolio, which Correct. I understand. And I've been very transparent about the difference. All the things I'm doing with my people is being a good human, <laughs> period. If you're a good human and the bottom line is you're there to offer value. You're there to help people. You are a good human. You will win, period. Um take out all the rest of the crap. That's all extra. And sorry, I'm always like my language is I'm always trying to be good with my language. However, what I will tell you is that at the end of the day, that's all cake and cookies. The meat and potatoes of who you are is really what matters. Like you do you, you be you, your unique you, your unique value proposition, your unique selling benefits is who you are. So be the best you you can be, be of value, create value in all that you do. Social media, emails, um, you know, I put out newsletters. I, I'm just helpful as much. I hope that when people say Julie Roy, my name, they say, wow, she's super generous with her knowledge. She's super helpful. And she really is a good human. 
I hope at the end of the day, that's what they're saying about me. I hope they don't say she's a capital raiser. Peace out. <laughs> That's really what I feel about it, you know, um, and I'm not not proud about what I'm doing, but that is, again, the least amount of my value is brought in from that. So. Well, Julie, helpful for anyone that's that on. has helped me. You've taught me so much more than I think you've ever known. We've learned, we've laughed, we've cried together. I. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned oh, so all much. the things, yes. All the things. I'm so happy that you were the first female, I think the best on this show. So thank you for being here. If well, when any... you're the first, you're not the last. <laughs> there you go. Right. There you go. Yeah. I love it. And thank you everyone for being here for our live taping. Like I said at the beginning, you can hear all of the amazing insights that Julie gave us on all places where you listen and download podcasts. So please listen and like and share because we would love to hear um, any more from you. And if you have any questions on our next guest, we will be here at the on June 27th. We will be back with the mindset of raising capital. It's a new, a new different take on raising capital in a different mindset. So very excited to have that. If you have any questions, we do have a pathway to GP mentorship program. You can get with us at massive.capital forward slash coaching. If you have any questions, please reach out to us at go.massive.capital. And we'd love to help you in all of your education needs. Thank you so much, Julie. You have been a privilege to talk to today. It was just like talking to one of my favorites. Thank you for being here. Like I said at the beginning, my name is Maria Marks at Raising Private Capital with Massive Masters. Thank you and have a great rest of your Thursday. Thank you.